go. Good morning, Bright Church. It's 1245. We're running just a little late. Uh, it's also uh, not morning, and it's also the timer's a little bit off, guys. You can turn that one off. We will begin now. Good morning again. Welcome to Bright Church. If you guys are here for the first time, it's good to see you. If you guys are here for the millionth time, it's just as good to see you. We are one family. No matter the reason you guys are here, maybe you've been invited. Maybe you've always come. Maybe you're here with friends, with family. Maybe you just kind of stumbled in by accident. We're very, very glad to see you. We're very glad that you could come and just join our family this morning, the church as a whole, as it gathers on Sunday to worship God. And you can be here and worship him as well, to, to be poured into, to praise him, to participate in communion. Uh, my name is Pete Kachuk. I'm one of the leaders here. I've got a beautiful band here as well that's getting ready to worship with you. Um, Bright Church at its core, has a mission that constitutes of three separate phrases, to save lives, to show love, to study the Lord. That's what our heart is about, and it comes back to the man, the God that we worship, uh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, uh, and we worship him through the Holy Spirit. And so today, again, we want to come back to Jesus, to come back to the heart of it all, to bow before God, to experience him today, uh, to bow before Jesus, to remember his sacrifice uh, as we come before him this Sunday morning. So I would like to ask you guys, as, as a token of showing honor to that great being that we worship, to Jesus Christ, to the, the Holy Spirit, can we all stand as a sign of respect to come before him this morning in prayer, to quiet our hearts, and just feel for a second that stillness and the quietness through which God speaks to us. Father, we call down your presence this morning. It's so good to gather all together. It's so good to be here with our brothers and sisters, people who love us, accept us, uh, bring us closer to you, uh, people who you've put around us. We believe that this is where you've put us. This is all part of your providence and will. We thank you this morning especially for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the fact that you, God, would somehow in your plan of salvation for this lost, degenerate humanity, you had yourself come down to die on this earth for us, to become like us, to give yourself up as a sacrifice for us. We worship that and thank you for it, Jesus. Be with us today. Help us experience you in a special way. You don't need us. We need you, but you make yourself so available to us. It's these, these mornings that we come together where we can just put cares aside and say, Father, we come back to the heart of it all, to the heart of worship, to the heart of, of your sacrifice. Thank you, Father. We worship you. We glorify you. We just pray, be with us today. Bless us. Speak into our hearts. Amen. Please continue to stand. We will have our Bible reading today. Brother Andre will be reading Psalm 86. morning church psalm 86 a prayer of david incline your ear o lord and answer me for i am poor and needy preserve my life for i am godly save your servant who trusts in you you are my god be gracious to me o lord for to you do i cry all the day Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great, and you do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life. 
and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This is the word of God. Good afternoon, church. For the first song, I just want us to remember, just as he spoke, uh, how glorious God is. And let's start with the beautiful one.
first time I heard it, I just knew we had to do the song uh, as a church. It's, it's beautiful. It's about uh, just remembering Christ and what he did for us. And not just once a month on communion, but every day. And as we sing this song, I just want you to think about how different our life would be if we really, truly, daily, through the struggles, through the stresses, remembered and rejoiced in Christ. Um, and actually, as we're singing this song, before we sing this song, I want you guys all just put a smile on your face just right now. Just go ahead and smile. Just continue to smile to this, throughout the song. Um, I recently heard a sermon, and I love what the speaker said. Um, if we remember correctly, we rejoice fully. So let's do it right now and rejoice as we sing.
so good I forgot to come up and like for a second there I was like, is, uh, can we just keep singing? Just <laughs> um, uh, that was so good, folks. Um, we are a welcoming community. We always say this. Uh, if we say show a love, we mean that uh, in, in reality. Just, you know, it's so easy to love somebody who's like, oh, man, I love the people in Africa and, and third world countries. Why don't you show some love to somebody who's in a first world country right next to you? You know, so get out of your seats right now. This is what we do every single time. Show some love. Make somebody feel welcome. Welcome them in. Be Jesus to somebody today. So go ahead. Get out of your seats. Shake their hand. Welcome them to church. Welcome them to knowing Jesus and experiencing him today.
Right. Uh, welcome, welcome again. We're so, so happy to have uh, everybody that could make it out today. Again, very happy to have you guys here. A couple of quick announcements before we dive into our message today, dive into God's word. Um, first of all, um, Yuri, would you like to say it yourself? Just kind of thank all the folks that participated in Family Day. Why don't you come up here, brother? So unusual, everybody. But I'm so excited, definitely, you know, to tell everybody that event went so good. We had almost 4,000 people. Can I believe? Praise God. We sang songs, and I like the English service brought some band, amazing band. They sang songs out there. You guys put some food. Uh, from you guys, you make those mechanical bowl. And I'm surprised that bull was still lasted for four hours, you know. Nobody broke it, you know, which is great. You know, good, good job. But I want to just from my heart tell everybody thank you so much for participation to be with that family day. And you know what? Lots of neighbors came. Police department came. Fire department came. CHP came. They were so thrilled. They were so amazed, you know, how was everything went well organized. So... Just pray, you guys, and lastly, lastly, remember we were saying, like, we have some presents because it's 90th anniversary of our church. We decided to get 90 presents, and I pray, and I trust the Lord that we're going to have 90 presents. Can you imagine it was a Friday, it was 89 presents? Amazing. Then I came to the park. And a last presence lady came in, and she said, yeah, this is the one. I said, you know what? This is 90th. We're done. Praise God. And, of course, uh, after that, there was a more presence. It was 100 semi-presence, you know. But I was, I was just, just, just uh, happy because we did what we're supposed to do. And the last presence was also interesting. You know, nobody took that presence. It was just a little piece of paper. And um, everybody had the choice to pick it up, anything. But there was a piece of paper that says, like, a welcome, thank you so much. And then that piece of paper would go down and down and down. It was the last one, the last one left. Can you imagine? There was a last one left. Nobody picked it up. There was a last one left on the table. And it was last call. So a guy picked it up, that paper. That's just an example for us, you guys. You know, we, we sometimes, you know, don't evaluate precious God that we have like a, a you know, his value, same thing was over that piece of paper. He, I said, can you take a look? I thought it was like a, just a photo. He opened up that present. It was vacation paid off in a resort for two people. Can you imagine? It was great. So, you guys, again, thank you so much for being with us. And if you have any suggestions or ideas, let us know, and we'll just apply those ideas. That way, next event is going to be much better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, was anybody here a raffle winner? I mean, with anybody at all? A couple hands at least? No? Uh, whoever got that last, we got a couple. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Yuri, for your team. I mean, I, I understand how much work went into that uh, and how many long nights and uh, on top of your day job and just putting all that together. So uh, thank you. Can we just all say praise God? Uh, absolutely. It's just such a blessing for all of us. Um, I remember we were bringing the bull in, the, the trailer was backing up, and uh, one of the older gentlemen in our congregation is like, what is that? I'm like, oh, it's a, it's a bull. They're going to sit on it, and it's going to try to buck him up. And so he proceeds to tell me about how you properly take care of bulls. And finally, I have to stop and say, sir, it's a mechanical bull. <laughs> he was a little, uh, a little confused, <laughs> but we had, we had a ton of fun. Uh, we're we're going to keep it with mechanicals because what is dead, uh, we cannot kill it. So uh, I'm afraid for livestock, man. It's going to be, we're going to ride it in the morning and then cook it in the afternoon, I, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, all right. Uh, some more just praise reports. Ladies Latte has had an incredible season. Uh, uh, Miss Tanya Yanovsky and her crew, I... I can't even name all of you guys that are participating or have been a part of that. Ladies Latte has been just such a huge blessing for the ladies in our church and the ladies in this community. Uh, they're, they're done for the summer, but I just wanted to once again say thank you from uh, our pastors and leaders for everybody who participates in that ministry and encourage you again. It starts again in September. The dates have already been set. Uh, who here? I know Daria's here somewhere. I know you're part of the team. Um, 
who else is part of the team? Um, uh, Mari, yep. So you guys, ladies, if, you, if you're interested in that for next season, make sure you come up to one of the lady leaders um, and speak to them and get those dates and be ready in September when that starts up again. Um, uh, if you're new here, we always encourage you uh, to get in touch with us. Come up. You can get in touch with us one of four ways. There's an iPad in the foyer. We have an app. You can come up and talk to us directly after the service uh, or on the website. And we always, always encourage you, folks, this is so important. Do not be stagnant in your growth with Christ. You're either moving forward or backwards. That's the reality of it. Either you're feeding yourself, you're growing, you're intentional about your growth, or you're not. That's one or the other. And so that is why we have the growth track. If you've been saved, you need to be baptized. If you're baptized, you need to be a member of this congregation. You need to be accountable to somebody. There needs to be authority over you, somebody who can speak into your life. If, if you've done that, make sure you're in ministry. Make sure that you're participating. Make sure that you're giving back. Make sure you're in a community group. Make sure you're taking classes. We have classes Saturdays once a month here at the church, part of our seminary track where you can grow, continue to just go deep in your relationship with God. If you need counseling, make sure you find somebody, you speak to us. Again, that is why we have all of those resources here. Continue to grow in your walk with God. And now we're going to have the intro video for our message, and Brother Vadim is going to be delivering the word. Hey, my name is Ben. Hi, my name is Augustina. Hi, my name is Alex. Hi, I'm Peter. Hi, my name is Julia. I'm a professional tile setter. I'm half German. And I'm a dentist. Ich bin ein Deutscher. Ich wohnte in Deutschland für acht Jahre. I'm a civil servant. I love to help people. I'm a billing associate for a health organization. And I'm an earthquake engineer. I am a liquid crystal researcher. I'm currently studying health science to become a sonographer. And make these more efficient. I am a professional mother to two teenagers. And oh boy, are they a bunch of work. Sorry. And I'm a kids club staff at CFF. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I'm my parents' favorite daughter. And I'm recently married. Welcome, Bright Church. Am I on? Okay. We have been in a, our series in Ephesians on looking at our identity in Christ. And that's what we're going to take a look at today. I believe this is our last um, passage that we're going to take a look at. Before we start, I want you guys to turn to your neighbor and ask right now, do you have your spiritual armor on? Turn to your neighbor and say, do you have your spiritual armor on? <laughs> yes, of course. We have, we have an idea... We have an idea of, that, of the fact that there is a spiritual realm and that there is a spiritual war. And then the last part of Ephesians, we have the armor that we are to wear. So I feel like I'm, I'm a, a brother that is going to try to equip you guys to make sure that you have all of the information as you go into the uh, battle, as you go into battle on a daily basis. There are three things that I want us to take a look at, and those are the fact that we are victorious. We are already victorious. Jesus has paid the price. He has already, he has already paid the price for all of our sins. Not only that, but Jesus has already condemned the devil. He is already basically a, per he's a felon. He's um, let, he's still loose, but he will be put away. There is a time that's given to him so that he would be able to, for a time, still be active. There are three things that I want us to realize. First, I am victorious. You are victorious because we understand that there is a battle. We understand the battle. We understand who we're battling against. Number two, I and you are victorious because we understand the armor. We understand how to use the armor, what the armor is given for us, to us for. And thirdly, we, under, we are victorious because of the gospel. Those are the three things that, and there should be a PowerPoint maybe a little bit later on. It'll come up. So let's read the passage. The passage is Ephesians chapter 6. If you would open that, that up with me. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 
10 to the end. Pretty large passage. I'd like to read this. Among all of the things that I would say right now to you, the most important is the reading of the passage. This is God's word speaking to our souls, to our hearts. Let's pay attention. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all of the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication, uh, with all prayer and supplication. To, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that, word, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to pro- proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, so that you also may know how I am and what I and what how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved uh, brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. We are victorious because we understand the battle. We understand that there is a battle. So what does Paul here mean? It says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We can be victorious over sin, over freeing captives from the devil's influence because the spirit of the victor is in us. Jesus sent his spirit into all believers so that all believers following him can be victorious. That is the reason that we can have be strengthened by his strength. Jesus' strength is what we need. There is no way we would be able to uh, defend ourselves. There's no way we would be able to fight against devil and his schemes if it wasn't for what Jesus has done. And you know, when you think about this, this is the most amazing thing, that God proved his love to us by sending Jesus, and by not only sending an example, but sending a sacrifice for your and my sins, for our transgressions against God. We are victorious because the spirit of the victor, the Holy Spirit, Jesus' spirit, is in us. He also mentions this. It says, take on the whole armor of God. It doesn't say take part, just take this one. And I hope this makes sense to us. Think about this, a soldier going into battle, thinking, you know, I don't really need my helmet. It's kind of clunky, I, I can't wear it too well. Uh, the belt, I, I, I don't think I need it. I'll take the sword, but mm, I don't need the breastplate. It, it's kind of heavy, I, I don't need it. I, I'd rather move around quicker. That doesn't make sense. You need all of the armor. You need to know how to use it, what it's for. That is what Paul is saying here. He need, he's saying, take on the whole armor of God. Do you, are, are you conscious of the full armor of God? Do you use it? If you, were to ask, if you were to be asked about one piece of God's armor, would you be able to share how that armor has protected you in your life in this week and the past month? There are so many schemes of the devil, and Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the schemes of the devil. More into the battle. Are you alone in the battle? We have this idea that, oh, I'm battling Satan alone. I'm against these demons. If you, you, know, if you realize this, a lot of times we do. I realized this yesterday. In preparing this, this whole week, man, would I see things in a different light? When you look at this thing against you, this thing against you, you, you know that there's something 
aside from possibly your mistakes that you're making that's against you in that spiritual realm that's stronger than you? Are we in this battle alone? Well, if you take a look at the passage, he says that you may be able to withstand. Who's you in this passage? Well, who's he writing to? He's writing to Ephesians, right? The church. He's saying, you, the church, you need to put on the whole armor of God. He doesn't say here, each and every one of you, although that could be implied. He says, you as a church, every single one of us, bright church, you need to put on the whole armor of God. We have this idea, again, that we are battling daily battles by ourselves. But that's not the case. That's not the case. We are one body. Jesus has united us under one, in one family. Next, he says, victorious over devil's schemes. He says a word over and over again that I really hope will be ingrained in our minds. I, I'm trying to make sure it's in my, in my mind, in my heart, that the devil is against me. Satan is against me. His minions, his demons are against me. I need to recognize who am I against, who is against me. These schemes of his, I need to recognize. It says in verse 12, for our struggle is not, listen, how many times he says against. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's a lot of against. There's a lot, there's a lot against us. And he has his schemes. Do we recognize these schemes? His attacks are intended to break us, to foster chaos. He wants to bring unbelief more and more into people's uh, lives. This idea that God is far away, he's not existent, he doesn't have or want anything to do with you. He wants to break relationships. He wants to raise up ungodly children. He wants us to lust after and cover over covet for things that will destroy us, our character. He wants us to be addicted physically, mentally, spiritually. This are, these are his schemes. He wants all of these results. So what does it mean to be victorious? To be victorious, it means exactly the opposite. We, through us, harmony is brought into the picture. Through us, God brings, builds trust among people in relationships. Through us, we build re edifying relationships. We raise up godly children. The things that we are given, we share with those people in need. We don't hoard things. We don't covet things, right? We share these things to people in need. And every single uh, addiction, physical, mental, spiritual, we aim to set those captives free. Who is waging war against us? I want us to take a look at passages of, that talk about Satan. Because we, we understand that there's, oh, maybe God's trying to teach me something. Maybe, maybe God, oh, what's wrong with this? Why is this happening, God? And we always have this conversation with God, which is what we're supposed to have. But a lot of times we're not aware of the enemy. It's not just God at work in our mind, in our uh, life. It's also Satan and his demons. He is also fostering a lot of problems in our lives. He's hindering our growth and our unity with God. Who is he? Well, I'm going to look at some passages, but firstly, we know that Satan is created. Satan is created. He cannot be everywhere. He does not share in all the attributes of God. He is not equal to God. He cannot be everywhere. Do you understand that Satan is somewhere right now and not everywhere? That blew my mind the first time I thought about this. Yes, his demons might be around, influencing, but Satan is somewhere. And you can bet when Jesus was on earth, on this earth, you can, I, I bet you he was around Jesus all of the time, messing things up, affecting people, influencing people. Very close to Jesus to make sure that he would not succeed. God reads your mind, Satan cannot. Satan has, is a fallen... He, uh, angel. He has rebelled against God, and he's declared war against God. He is also very powerful. He's akin to an angel. He has been observing humanity for thousands of years, and so he knows how to read people. He knows their body language. He knows their desires. He knows everything about you and me. Th think about this. Thousands of years monitoring humanity. Let's try this on them. Let's try this on them. 
There's a lot of social systems that have been tried on humanity, wars that we fought against each other. These are the schemes of the devil. Satan. He is called Lucifer, the shining one, the morning star, the sun of the morning. In Isaiah 14, 12, it's written, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? In Ezekiel 28, 12, it says, it gives us a bigger picture of how incredibly powerful and amazing he was before his downfall. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. What happened? If we go back to Isaiah 4.12, it gives us a bigger picture. It says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mountain of, of the congregation of the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. As soon as he spoke those words, he was cast down away from God, off God's mountain, away off of, from heaven. I believe that God gave angels a will. Angels today, till this day, decide that they're going to worship God. And many theologians believe that Satan, once he became prideful, took a third of the angels in heaven with him. So he has this army with him. It's not just him alone, a lone rebel against God and his people and his creation. He has an army, a powerful army, a lot more powerful than any one of us. Satan's position. Do you know that he's called the prince of the air? Prince of the power of the air? In Ephesians 2.2 it says, people following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. He's in charge of, the, of evil people, of evil spirits, of evil men, the spirit who is at work in the sons of disobedience. He is a ruler. He is not only the prince of the power of the air, he is also a ruler. In 1 John, uh, 1 John 5, 19, it says, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Satan has a lot of influence in the world. Did you know that Satan has a kingdom? Matthew uh, 12, 26, Satan, Jesus says, and if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Satan rules over his angels. There's a hierarchy within his uh, rulership. Um, Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. There's a subordination going on there. He is a ruler. He is a god. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. I'm hoping that this is, tr is etching out an image of the power of Satan. That, that he's not just, oh, it's Satan. He, it's like a bat or some kind of evil spirit. He's already defeated. He has power still to this day. We can see that in our lives. Satan is the president and founder of his own religion. The Bible speaks about this. And I wish that slide was up there. Satan has his own church. In Revelation 29, 9 says, synagogue of Satan. Satan has his own gospel. In Galatians 1, 8, we read another, other gospel. Satan has his own ministers, 2 Corinthians eleven fifteen. 15. His servants. Satan has his own doctrine, 1 Timothy 4, 1, the teaching of demons. Satan has his own communion table and his own cup. 1 Corinthians 10, 21 says, cup of the demons. This is crazy. He's trying to copy God in all of these different ways. And we know that he is the ultimate counterfeiter. 
Satan has a lot of power in this world. Let's talk about his purposes. His purpose is he is a deceiver. We read in John 8, 44, you are, Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil, and, you will, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Revelations 12, 9, and the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he, has, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Satan is the great counterfeiter. We already talked about that fact that he's copying God in everything. And he will be copying and trying to fool the nations about, hey, this is the Messiah. I am the Messiah. And he's going to replicate everything that the Old Testament uh, has revealed to us when we know that Jesus has already fulfilled all of the prophecies within himself. Satan is the great divider, and we see that within the church body, within families, within small groups, between friends, between spouses, between kids. He is the great divider. He is the deceiver. He is the great counterfeiter. He is the divider. He is the destroyer. Satan destroys he, he destroys through adversity. We read in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowl, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He hinders us. In fact, he hindered Paul at some point. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 18, because, you, because we wanted to come to you, he says, I, Paul, again and again, but get this, but Satan hindered us. That Come on, Apostle Paul? Yes. But Satan hindered us. Satan's influence. There has been a lot of influence. Let's just take like the past maybe 50 years and take a look at it. just a couple of things, several things, that Satan has done to deceive us as a uh, society and humanity. First of all, in the 60s, sexual revolution of the 60s broke down this solid edifying home where children were brought up and they were to master their own desires. Now the desires master every single person that comes into this world. Not truth. We're not, we're not moved by truth. Hey, I want that. I'm going to earn enough money. I want that. I'm going to steal it. All of these desires now master us because why? The wholesomeness, the edifying home has been actually destroyed, is being destroyed. Another thing, uh, the attempt to redefine marriage as a union of same-sex people has brought confusion to this definition of what a family is and what it's supposed to do in society. Gender dysphoria is confusing our generation. There is now a focus not on the God-given shape that we are given to serve our community. It's community, what can you do for me? Rated our very video games and movies they have destroyed the sanctity of life. They have just destroyed the sacredness of intimacy in marriage. All of these things are the schemes of the devil. Do you see how we are affected by this? I, I, you know, the, the, the deeper that I dive into this, I, I really just need to sit down and write down, okay, let's think of all the different ways, the mistakes of thinking about my life and certain areas in my life that I have. I need to sit down and think about it. What? I don't think about this correctly. We were just talking about if we were to remember correctly, we would worship holy. This correct thinking is a must. Satan's influence. This last, this last one could be the, the craziest one yet. He has fooled us. Maybe he will. Maybe, I don't think it's actually that bad just yet. But he's fooling people to commit suicide, to kill themselves. That's a scheme of the devil. In fact, we read in the news, in Australia, doctor-assisted suicide euthanasia is not legal. So we recently read in the news an example of a person that's flying from Australia to Switzerland so that he can finish his life. On what grounds? He does not have a terminal Ill illness. He is 104 years old, well-renowned associate at a university, and his claim is, look, my life is degrading. I've had enough. I need to end it. And I decide to end it. 
You know the problem with this is? People are taking his deeds, his, his worldview, and saying he is a pioneer. He is a pioneer of a new era where people get to decide when they have had enough of life. Do you see? This is crazy how the, devil, the devil's schemes are just lies that are ending people's lives literally. 104 years old, I want more. Especially for the success that this person has had. Now, that's maybe on society, but what about in our lives? The devil attacks us emotionally. Somebody says something bad about you, right? Something, uh, you, uh, you have an argument, you have an illness, you find out you have a disease, and you feel angry, you feel sad, you feel violent. The devil, those are the devil's personal attacks. He attacks us emotionally. He attacks us financially. Something in your home breaks, your car breaks, and you don't have enough money. Your investments fall through. He attacks us spiritually. You, I don't know, maybe you've felt this sometimes. There's cloud above you that you, you don't know. What, what's this foggy thinking? Where did this come from? You start questioning God's goodness, and you start thinking that about reality as if it's subjective and not objective. Now, we recognize that this is all part of the battle. And if we understand the battle, we can become victorious. We are victorious because we understand the battle. We are, there is no way. I want to make two more points about the battle. There is no way that we would be able to defeat David, uh, um, Satan, devil, and his uh, demons. A lot of D words there. Whose responsibility is it to put on the armor? My responsibility. It's my responsibility. It's not, you know, help me, help me put this jacket on. I need this armor. I need, there's no other way to withstand his attacks. Second thing, Paul says here a really interesting word. He says wrestle. We wrestle against. That, that implies like hand-to-hand combat. That hand-to-hand combat is really tiring. I'll tell you about, uh, about something that's happening with me. I've been helping a family member for several years now. And the conversations that we're getting, uh, going into are deeper, they're harder, because the, the situations that Satan has got this person into are getting worse and harder to get out of. And, I, you know, just recently I figured out, man, I'm exhausted. Praying for this person, trying to help this person, get, trying to give God the advice to this person, getting constant calls, and this is affecting my life. This is affecting my mind. This is affecting my spouse, my wife. This is affecting the way I raise my son. This is affecting me. I get exhausted. But you know what? I can't be more grateful to be in the center of God's will. When I realize that I'm fighting for a soul that will be in the lake of fire for eternity without God, oh my goodness, my battle, I, I get a lot more strength. I get strong in Jesus because I know that his armor, his word, his spirit can change the person's heart and mind. Are, do you feel exhausted? That's the battle. That is the battle that we have to be conscious of. Secondly, we are victorious because we understand the, the battle. Uh, secondly, we understand we are victorious because we understand the armor. He goes through this list. Firstly, he says, I feel like, I, you know, we're in the army. I'm going to tell you, put this on, put this on, put this on, put this on. This is what this is for. This is what this is for. And I hope that you, you sense this urgency that if you don't, you're not conscious of this armor, that you need to get this armor on quickly. As soon as you leave these doors, you're sitting here. Maybe that those attacks are happening in your mind right now. And we need to be conscious of those. First one, what role does the belt play? A uh, Roman soldier. So e- Ephesians, uh, during the time when this uh, letter was written to the Eph- uh, uh, Ephesians, to that church, the analogy is of a Roman soldier. The belt was to gird like a tunic together so that it wouldn't be caught on anything when the person's uh, running. Um, and this idea is very helpful. This idea of tightly girded clothing by a belt is the perfect analogy to girding close to you the truth of reality. And this is what's happening in our country. People say, you know, you have your own truth, I have my truth. Well, isn't all truth like subjective? Isn't all truth truth? No, it's not. There's objective truth. And that truth is outside of humanity. 
This is, this is like one of the main arguments against people who don't believe that God exists. Who is right then in our morality? You are right. Hitler's right. I'm right. Who says this is good and this is bad if we don't have some, someone outside of us telling us, decree, making decrees about what's good and bad? So first thing is the belt of truth. This is the first piece of armor to make sure that we understand that there is objective truth. Truth is not changed by our, our emotions or opinions. And a lot of people can, they might say, well, aren't you arrogant saying that there is objective truth and that objective truth is what you're claiming? I believe that it would be a, uh, think about this. Isn't it more arrogant to actually tailor truth to your own preferences? Think about this. People are actually arrogant, tailoring truth. Hey, I want this, this, and this, so that must be the truth. That's arrogant. That is for sure arrogant. Now, having the truth implies that we walk in the truth. Having the truth implies that we walk in the truth. If we can talk Christianese, right, and then we are actually falling day to day in our battles, that Christianese is not helping. That truth is not part of our life. It's very important that we recognize that uh, we cannot defeat the devil if we just speak Christianese and not um, actually walk the walk. Jesus is the ultimate example of living in truthfulness, living in the truth and in integrity. How did the centurion who was watching him on the cross know that he was the son of God? By the way that Jesus lived. How did the, the, uh, the thief who was being crucified know that he was the son of God? This man has done nothing wrong. That was his claim. They see by their actions this person is walking in truth. Now, in order to defeat the enemy, we, not, we must not only uh, must, we, must we know the truth, know Jesus, but he is the truth. He is supposed to, his, his spirit is supposed to produce fruit through us, the fruit of the spirit. Secondly, the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness implies the righteousness of Christ that we have. As the perfect son of God, Jesus came down to this earth and he died taking on all of our sins, all of our <clears throat> uh, transgressions against God. We have a positional righteousness in Jesus before God. So when you start a relationship with Jesus, and I, I really hope that you don't leave this place if you haven't started one. If you start a relationship with Jesus, know that the Trinity in heaven has a celebration. They have a celebration that this person started a relationship with me, a relationship that's going to edify them, that's going to perfect them for our kingdom. Satan will attack that righteousness. Satan will always attack that righteousness. We know that God convicts, but Satan condemns. Conviction only lasts as long as it takes time for us to repent. Condemnation is intended for a lifetime, forever. Satan condemns, God convicts. Do you know how to fight against the flaming arrows of condemnation? We have to realize that God, Jesus, has already done everything for us to be righteous. That's the only thing that we have to realize and submit ourselves to be part of his family. We are not judged because we are part of the family of the judge. We are adopted through Jesus into God's family. We are part of the judge's family. We are not to be judged according to God's judgment on the, uh, the same judgment that applies to the believers, uh, unbelievers, excuse me. We are part of his family. Question comes up, how can I be righteous if I sin? Like, I made mistakes this week. I sinned against God. Let's, let's, let's make sure we call him what it is. It's a sin. It's a transgression against God. What he intends and we go against it. Consciously or unconsciously, we have, if it's unconsciously, then we have been uh, deceived by the devil. We're already part of the, the entire plan uh, for us to sin against God. Jesus paid for past, present, and future sins. In a relationship with God now, what we have is the forgiveness of all of our sins in the future. 
And the best analogy that I came to understand, or the story, is about Abraham. Do you guys remember when Abraham became righteous or counted righteous? Was counted righteous? Paul says in Romans that when he trusted God, that trust, that faith, was credited to him as righteousness. We read also a very interesting situation that happened a little time afterward. Do you guys remember the situation with Pharaoh? Where he came up, Abraham, and said, you know, they're probably going to kill me. You say that you're my sister. And God shows up in a dream to Pharaoh and says the following, Yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this. I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife. Get this. God says, for he is a prophet. And he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you will shall surely die, you and all who are yours. This, fa- this passage baffled me. I see Abraham's actions on one hand, and I see God stepping in on the other hand. Like, how? And I realize that who is the one that deems a person righteous? It's God. He says, you are righteous. He says, Abraham is a prophet, therefore Abraham is a prophet. His reality is objective reality. He determines what reality is. God proclaims that you and I are righteous, not because of your mistakes. Excuse me, God proclaims that you're righteous, not because of your mistakes, but because that of your faith and trust in him. Because we believe, because we trust in Jesus, he deems us righteous. So think about this. When, when we do sin, God convicts us, his Holy Spirit convicts us, And it's a pinpoint of light that says this is wrong and this is how to change it so that you can grow. Whereas Satan does not want that. He wants a life of condemnation. Romans 5.17 says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. But we need to also understand this. We are positionally righteous in Jesus. But we are also made righteous through this process that we call sanctification because of what the Holy Spirit is doing within us. Every believer who submits their life's agenda to God, the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus' Spirit comes into them and starts changing their character, starts changing their soul. This is why... Uh, We are called to sanctification because our practical living out of the truth is proof that we are positionally in Jesus. And I I love this definition. Sanctification is becoming what what you already are in position. I'll read that one more time. Sanctification is becoming what you already are in position. In Christ, we are positionally righteous. And whatever schemes the devil sends our way, We know that it's about our relationship with God. He is the one that deems us to be righteous. All of those arrows that are sent uh, towards us will bounce off that breastplate of righteousness, no matter how many. By the guidance of the Holy Spirit, when I'm convicted, I can stand up again because of the righteousness of Jesus. Here's a passage to encourage that sanctification. Timothy, 1 Timothy 6.11 But as for you, O man, man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Next are the shoes. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Has anybody, I want to ask you guys, has anybody served here in the military in a war zone? No? No? You can probably answer this question in spite of the fact. What do you think? In a war zone, do you take your shoes off? Do you sleep with your shoes on? Yes. Why? Because it's a war. Any time of the night, any time of the day, you need your shoes on. You have to get up quick. Get, uh, get the rest of your armor on. Maybe you sleep with your armor. That's awesome, right? You're, you're ready as soon as the person comes in. Okay, who, where's our enemy? We always must have a readiness Because that gospel of peace, we have to share with every single person. And again, this comes back to um, gospel being at work over and over in our life. We have to be ready. And over the past 
uh, well, however long I've been doing youth work, I've had situations where I get calls at 3 a.m. I have to call, I have to talk with that person. Look, this is what's happening in my life. Can you help me? And we talk for 30 minutes, an hour. I remember a situation when a friend of mine uh, took a train ride uh, into town from a different, a different city. This was back in Washington, in the state of Washington. Didn't tell me. He was going to meet a girl. That girl stood him up. He was in a hotel room. Got drunk. Calls me and says, hey, can you pick me up? I come into the hotel room. He's bawling. He's frustrated. He feels condemned, depressed. And that evening, I spent, man, what, this is a battle. This is crazy. I, I had to help him get, okay, let's get you to like, my, my parents' house. We can spend the night there. And the next thing, and the, and the next morning, when I was uh, driving him to the uh, train before I had to go work uh, to the train station, he's like, dude, why did you do this? And you know, I, I don't know why I did that. I only now start realizing, man, that was just the gospel at work. It's the kindness, it's the helpfulness that we have to be ready for. We have to be ready for uh, to disarm all of our adversaries, those people that are held captive to their wrong ideas, to the deception of the devil at any time of the day, at any day of the week. We have, given, we have been given a foundation of peace. Ephesians 2.4 says that Jesus, he is our peace. Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, anytime you are attacked and you are, you, you are you're in doubt, rem, this is how important scripture is. Rem, remember, memorize this passage. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Anytime that Satan attacks us, we are ready because of the peace that we've been granted. Next, the shield. We understand we have to have a belt of truth. We have to have the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the, uh, the readiness of the shoes of the gospel of peace. The shield is next. The shield in the Roman uh, times basically covered most, if not all, of their body. This was protecting them from all of these arrows, potentially, that were shot at them. In fact, skin hides were drenched and soaked in water and put up over the shield so that if there were flaming arrows, those would be quenched. Those would just not have any effect. And that was the imagery that Paul has us uh, thinking about here, that all of the arrows will be quenched, will be extinguished by the shield of faith. If the, burning rep, uh, if the burning arrows represent every kind of attack by Satan, then your faith and trust in Jesus will deflect and put out every single attack. Let me ask you again. How many arrows? All of them. All of them. That's how important. In fact, other translations say, not in addition to, above all, take the shield of faith. Do you understand how many arrows? I mean, think about this. Arrows upon arrows that Satan shoots and his demons shoot at us. Thousands every single day. Billboards, ideas, text messages. Somebody said something about me. I don't agree with this. I'm angry. Emotions. Thousands upon thousands. And do you understand that this is going to be billions upon trillions of arrows throughout your lifetime? That's crazy. Trillions of arrows that are going to be sent to you, young or old, it doesn't matter, and the shield of faith will extinguish, will quench every single one of them. That is an important piece of armor. Our faith and trust in Jesus is what gets us into a salvific re relationship with God. There is another uh, imagery here that I'd like to expose you guys to. There were formations, because of the shields, there were formations that the Romans used, different formations. One was the testuda, where it actually looked like a... Um, a turtle, right? In the front were shields, on the side were shields, above were shields, and they covered the entire body of soldiers that were going into attack. Think about what my shield of faith brought in with your shield of faith, but with somebody else's shield of faith does as a church body. That's amazing. We can, and basically, this is amazing. When you think about this, what the Romans did, their tactic, what they did was line up and they would just literally plow through the front lines. They would separate the front lines and would be able to now take care of one, time, uh, one uh, uh, group of people separately from another group of people. 
That phalanx that the Greeks has was, was basically no match for this. They would just plow through them. When we stand together and have our shields of faith together, encouraging each other, saying, look, it's, it's a matter of you trusting Jesus. He will come through. He is faithful. That is an incredible piece of armor that stands against the schemes of the devil. This is why it's so crucial to be part of a small group. If you're not part of a small group, you need to get into a small group. You need to grow with a, a body of believers. You need to go through the growth track that we've been talking about. Get educated. I am so thankful that we have these classes, that I can learn from, that I can pass this uh, understanding of where that we got the Bible, of history, onto my uh, children, onto my uh, son. This is an amazing piece of armor. And how do we make sure that, field of, that the shield of faith is strong? If we get attacked into one area of our life over and over again, go find verses. Go find Bible verses and memorize them. Believe the verses. The trust in God's word gives you strength. He will be faithful. This is amazing. When you are faithful and you're proactive in memorizing verses, the Holy Spirit will remind you these verses in due time, and you can defend and defeat the devil and his uh, schemes. This is incredibly important to have this armor. Next, why do Christians need that helmet of salvation? The battles are where? Up here, in our mind. We can say in our mind, in our hearts, in us. This is a battle of ideology. Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Ephesians 4, 17, we were just covering this. So this, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Do you see the contrast? Renewing of mind, there's ignorance in the mind. They don't know the battle. They don't know what the armor is for, how to use the armor, the fact that it's there. Where can our thoughts come from? We say that when we get an idea from God, that's revelation. When we get an idea from Satan, what's that? That's temptation. When you get an idea, when you get an idea, what, what do you call that? Stupidity. No. no. But we're going to get ideas from different places, right? How do I test whether an idea is from God or not? We were just going over this in our small group on Friday. Does the idea agree with the Bible? You have an idea. I want to do this. I want to invest here. I need to make this decision. Does the ag idea agree with the Bible? I'm going to go through these pretty quick. Does the idea make me more like Jesus? Do other believers confirm this idea? Is the idea a thought convicting or condemning? Because we know condemning thoughts come from Satan. Convicting thoughts come from God. Does this idea go in line with my God-given shape? I, mean, I shared this example in the small group. Uh, think about it. I get an idea. I need to be the uh, organizer of a worship team, and I'm going to be the singer, front and center. I I'm shaped to sing in the shower, and when everybody else is loud, I'll sing with you. That's not what my God-given shape is. If I get an idea that it's not in line with my God-given shape, I should be careful with that. That might actually lead to pride in my life. There's so many schemes of the devil. Does this idea give me peace? Does this idea give me peace? God is a God of order not of confusion. He will send peace if this is from him, if this idea is from him. 2 Corinthians 10.5 actually describes a very, very practical thing we have to do, and we have to be conscious of it. It says, chap uh, chapter 10, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. I love that word. Destruction of fortresses. We are, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Every thought captive. You get a thought? Check it. Where did this thing come from? Is it my, my thought? Is it a thought from God? Is it a thought from Satan? 
Sometimes the devil attacks us by sending captives to us asking questions. I'm going to ask you this question. Think about this. Would you be able to answer this if your neighbor asked you? Why are there so many contradictions in the Bible? What would you answer? Somebody comes up to you. A captive of Satan asks you this question. I, no, so I keep trying to ask. I keep kind of. Uh, I keep trying to formulate this in terms of this ideology that they are captives. They are people who are making decisions, but they are captives. They don't realize. One of the ways that you can ask: Show me one. That like takes takes care of ninety percent of the conversation. Ninety percent of the conversations. All you know, show me a contradiction. Now, for the rest of them, we need to get educated. The 10% for which we have to actually stand and give an account, we need to make sure that we can uh, answer their question. This is why we study the Bible. We get into a small group. We go through what God said. We memorize scripture passages. We, under we need to understand how to answer those tough questions. I'll give you another one. Uh, again, this is like homework, if you will. Think about this. Our belief... Our salvation rests on one thing, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus did not resurrect, our faith is futile. That's what Paul says in Corinthians. So, question. I come up to you, somebody else comes up to you and says, prove to me that Jesus indeed resurrected. How would you answer? This is why it's important to get like, into classes of apologetics, right? What, what, what are the possibilities? There's a whole bunch of theories. I'll, I'll let you guys uh, research that. The helmet of salvation protects our thoughts, our mind, because we stand understanding that salvation is necessary. I'm going to educate myself in the Word of God so that I will not be attacked and I will not fall. The helmet of salvation protects us from the thoughts, ideas, desires that the evil one sends because it represents the mind of Christ that every believer matures in. The helmet of salvation is the mind of Christ that every believer matures in. The sword, of the, uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When Paul used this word sword, the, the association that F uh, Ephesians had was not a huge, long, broad sword. It was actually six to ten inches, like close for, for really close combat. And again, that, that's where we get this idea that we're supposed to, we are going to have to wrestle. It was supposed to be used to precisely wound the enemy in a specific vulnerable place. We must take the sword of the Spirit. And it's been actually, we've been talking about it throughout all of the armors. This is uh, the word of God, the sayings of God, what God has actually said. We memorize, we keep in our heart of hearts. This is the weapon, the, the Bible is the weapon that has a lot of swords, a lot of swords, a lot of sayings of God that we can use in specific situations. And I don't, probably don't need to remind you guys what Jesus did. You guys remember what Jesus did when he was tempted? Do you remember when Jesus was baptized? Who was there? John the Baptist, people. I'm going to make the case that Satan was there. God the Father said, this is my beloved son. And Satan right after says, if you are the son of God, and he tempts him in three ways, and we know these ways. These are obvious ways. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And if you, if you go through that passage in Matthew 4, you will see that that's how Satan tempted Jesus every single time, and every single one of those things. The, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But what did Jesus, he quote, what did Jesus do? He quoted specifically, said, this passage trumps whatever you're trying to temp tempt me in. And it's like, take this Satan. And he comes at him again. Take this. You know what happened after the third time to Satan? You guys remember? He fleed. He, he, had, he ran away. Do you imagine, can you imagine that victory in our life? When you catch a thought, hold it captive, and say, this is not a thought. This is not an idea. This is not an emotion from God. Remind yourself scripture. This is what God says to do here. The devil will have to flee. The devil will flee. He will go away. The demons will like, boom, like a huge bomb just exploded and just annihilated all of them. That's what's going to happen when we, I, I don't know why I went to bomb from a dagger, but that's the destruction it has. Yeah, 21st century um, warfare. The word of God. Now, let me make a statement really quick about the, this importance of memorizing scripture. 
Most of you are probably taking a chemistry class or anatomy class, anatomy physiology. Raise your hand. So a lot of, yeah, a lot of people have taken a chemistry. Do you remember how you and a study buddy or a, a study group had to sit down and ask you, hey, recite to me the location, the, the place where this element is found or, or this organ is found in the body? And that was normal. That was completely normal because you were preparing for what? A test. If we understand that there is a battle going on, doesn't it make sense to, for us to form these groups? And it shouldn't be awkward when we agree to memorize some scripture together and say, hey, can you really quick recite me? Not out of prideness, you know, hey, I got it memorized and you didn't. No. It's, you're encouraging the person. We agreed to meet this. I did this in a discipleship uh, several times in uh, discipleship where we, we said, let's memorize this one. Let's memorize this one. And we would get together, and the person went first. I went second. I went first. The other pers person went second. And we just recited this per uh, passage back to each other. Doesn't that make sense? That shouldn't be awkward. That should be like common sense. If we're going to use the word, it's like getting together and actually practicing. Like, like we're in a fencing duel, right? Let's practice. We're not trying to destroy each other. We're actually trying to help and encourage each other. So I really want to encourage, the more you have uh, Scripture memorized, the better. To my own shame, I will say, I'm still trying to fix this by taking these uh, Blagavist uh, classes. I have more math memorized than Scripture. And I'm realizing, like, that's bad. Sure, it helps me in my job and stuff, but that's bad. Scripture, most of my mind has to be quite, uh, just soaking up Scripture. That's what is important. We must memorize that which is uh, the, the sayings, the words of God, in order to stand against the schemes of the devil. Can you imagine when the devil comes at you, flinging arrows, and you're standing in this armor? Paul says one more thing. He says, always continually pray. Talk to your commander-in-chief. Uh, prayers of intercession. And that's important. We can get tired of this. A person calls and says, man, this is hard. Can you please pray for me? And, and your reaction is like, just, just pray yourself. Pray. But no, those prayers of intercession, intercession, intercession are incredibly important. Incredibly important. When we stand before God on behalf of another soul, and ask God, can you please send your Holy Spirit, send your guardian angels to protect this person, to change this person's mind, to change their heart. I would like to point out one thing about this armor before we go on to the gospel. Do you see any protection for the back? There's no protection for the back. And, and I'm going to make this conclusion kind of carefully. The assumption is that you don't turn your back to the enemy. You don't have anything in the back. The breastplate of righteousness, the front, the sh shield of faith, everything, you're going forward. You are victorious. You will be victorious. You're guaranteed that victory. Don't turn your back on that battle. Don't give up. You, don't, you already have that victory. The armor, the, uh, the armor that Paul mentions assumes that there are no deserters in Christ's army. There are no deserters in Christ's army. This is why James writes, Count it joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Aside from putting the armor of God and using the sword of the Spirit, which are the sayings of God, we must pray constantly. We must have that connection with God. We've talked about the fact that we are victorious because we understand the battle. We've said that we are victorious because we understand the armor. And I hope that piece by piece, you're like, I need this. I really need this. I really need this. I need to write the scripture down. I need to memorize this. This is incredibly important because as soon as you stop thinking about the Bible, God's word, that is a time when Satan can attack. Lastly, we are victorious because we understand the gospel. We are victorious because we understand the gospel. Jesus is the victor. He has defeated Satan by the wisdom of God. This is, when I think about this, I just, I, this is amazing how wise God is. That first 
law. You disobey, you die. You know what Jesus did? He used that law, God used that law, and brought salvation to humanity through that law. That law of death because of sin. See, we are spirits infused in this material realm. This is only for a time in these bodies. And just like a glove, right, when a hand goes into a glove, the hand controls the glove, so do our souls, so do we control what happens. And so is the, glo- is the hand responsible for what the glove does, so we are responsible for the actions that we have done and will do in this lifetime. And God will hold every single person accountable for disobeying him because he has infinite integrity. And in, uh, disobeying a being of infinite integrity means infinite punishment. Now, there is the old covenant. I want to make this in light of what we're going to have right now, communion. There is the old covenant. And if you remember, in the old covenant, sin was accounted, atoned for by the shedding of blood. And without the shedding of blood, there could be no atonement for uh, sin. I want you to put yourself in that situation right now where you are among the Israelites and Moses is coming with a bowl of blood And he was supposed to take this and splatter it over the people. He was supposed to splatter it over everything. I exaggerate there, but there are certain things that he was supposed to splatter over. But he was supposed to put this, and it was supposed to be sprinkled on the people. Can you put yourself in that situation? You're standing there, and there's actually a double meaning here. You're covered in blood. You feel guilty, yet that blood is the blood that's atoning for your sin. Now, the Old Testament, uh, the Old Covenant had no power in changing the soul because as soon as you went through that ritual, as soon as, as, soon as you were, your sins were atoned for, for because you saw this animal be killed on your behalf, your conscience understood that this was for my sin. You walk away, the next day you have to come back again. And again, and again, and again, bringing sacrifice after sacrifice because you have not only a guilty conscience, but you have no way of changing your heart. And, and with, with all love to those people who don't have a relationship with Jesus in this room right now, please understand your willpower has nothing to do with you defeating the devil. There's no way because you know what's going to happen? As soon as you feel like you've, oh my goodness, I did something morally good. That's called sin. It's called pride. Without Jesus, there's no way we can defeat the, uh, the schemes of the, uh, the Satan and his uh, demons. And so when Jesus comes in and he takes upon us, uh, he takes our sins upon himself, and he crucifies all of those sins, says, it is finished. Satan, you have no way of accusing, you have nothing to accuse my followers of. Nothing. You cannot accuse them of anything because I deem them righteous. And so now when we have this new covenant, covenant there, is new, there is also blood in this new covenant. But get this analogy. It is not sprinkled on us. We don't sprinkle the wine on ourselves. A lot of detergent after that, right? We ingest as a symbol of this internal change that the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives internally. The Holy Spirit that comes into every single person that gives up their life's agenda to follow Jesus, changes that person, and these are symbols of this new covenant, that the body was broken, the blood was shed on behalf of my transgressions so that I can be victorious. I have a, I have a real chance, not only a chance, I am guaranteed victory because J- Jesus is the victor, and the spirit of the victor is in every single believer. This is an amazing thing to think about. Satan has power. If you understand the battle, you are victorious. If you understand the armor, you are victorious. If you understand the gospel, we transgressed, Jesus has provided a way by his blood. You can come into a relationship with Jesus right now. Before we pray right now, I'd like to ask us to just consider coming to the table, this covenant that we have with Jesus, 
of remembering what he has done for us in a special way. If you are not at peace with God, you need to get in peace right now. While there is time, Hebrew, uh, a book of Hebrews says, while there is, it's called today, do not harden your heart. If you are not at peace with another believer, come up to that person. Say, look, I did this. I'm sorry. I, I, I had to do this yesterday. I had to do this yesterday. I, I was like not sure what this person thought about me. I need to text this person and say, hey, uh, we had this conversation. Are, are, is everything fine? If you, if you need to step out in the foyer, do that. Call that person if they're not here. Get into, a pe- into peace with everybody, with God, so that you can enjoy remembering the victor- victory that Jesus has, has had on behalf of us. And I can't wait to see his, him face to face. I hope you have this longing as well. Can we stand up right now? I'd like us to pray. I'm going to give you guys a minute to respond, to thank God for the victory that we have in Jesus. That even though there is this strong power against us, we are victorious because we understand the battle, we understand the armor, and we understand the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you. We are so thankful for your grace. We do not deserve it. And we realize that on a daily basis, Lord, that we, when we are convicted by your spirit, we come to you and we are so thankful that our conviction immediately goes away. That we, are, we can stand before you righteous because of Jesus. Jesus, thank you so much. Indeed, how we sang this last song, where would we be without you, Lord? Without what you have done in our lives, And this armor that you have educated us in, Lord, help us to be conscious of the battle, be conscious of putting on the armor and remembering your amazing gospel that you have already been victorious. Death has no hold on us. Satan has no victory over us because of your resurrection. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word, for your spirit, for each other, for the body of uh, the church. Thank you for our small groups. Thank you for our leaders and our pastors. Please bless every single person with closeness, nearness to you that we may be affected eternally. Thank you, Lord, for everything. Amen. cross and like he said let's remember the victory we have in Christ like I said earlier let's remember Christ fully and rejoice fully as well let's sing on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame Till my 
as we celebrated here in English service. Praise the Lord. Last Thursday we had a, a special meeting, business meeting, and we accepted new members of our church. Sean and Mariam are fully belong to our church. Welcome. Praise the Lord. I know that there are some other were joined. About 30 people last Thursday joined. Yes. Mm -hmm. We will read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. I hope we will have a scripture on, on the screen. Что Господь Иисус в ту ночь, который предан был, взял хлеб и возблагодарил, преломил и сказал: Примите, едите, все тело мое за вас сломимо, все творите мое воспоминание. Также и чашу после вечери и сказал им: Все чаша и снова завет моей крови, все творите, когда только будете пить мое воспоминание. For I received. Не нужно. Good. Мы помолимся, дорогие братья и сестры. We will pray over the bread. Господи, Отец Небесный, мы благодарны Тебе за Сына Твоего Иисуса Христа, нашего Господа, Который сошел с небес и стал хлебом живым. Мы узнаем Тебя, Господь, что сегодня, в третьем тысячелетии, мы можем через эти простые знаки вспоминать о столь великом событии, которое Ты соделал для нас, людей, спасши нас от грехов и беззаконий. Слава и благодарность Тебе! Здоровый принимает этот кусочек хлеба и имеет приобщение к святому телу Твоему. Во имя Иисуса Христа тебе об этом просим. Аминь. Аминь. Вас благодарил и преломил. And he broke the bread and said, take it. Можно садиться, пожалуйста. Discipline, please uh, take a stand out uh, because uh, you need to wait until you, your issue will be resolved. Those who are going to participate, please stand up before brothers will come to you. 
Иисус в ту ночь, которую предал, взял хлеб и сказал: "Примите и едите, все с телом мое за вас ломимое". Jesus at the night when he was uh, betrayed and crucified took bread, broke it and said, "Take, eat it in remembrance of me." Аминь. Amen. I hope everybody who wanted were able to participate. We did not miss anybody. Did we? Good.
Давайте мы встанем, и брат Игорь, пастор Игорь прочтет 25-26 стихи. In the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. We will pray over the cup. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your only begotten Son, who became sin, took our responsibilities for this sin, conquered the death, and became victor for us. Now, as a body of Christ, we are standing in front of you victorious, cleansed up by the power of the blood that Jesus Christ shed for us. Lord, I'm asking, please bless this cup. Bless all of us to take part of that, to drink it and have eternal life that will lead us into eternity. Thank you for your victory, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Sit down, please. Please stand up and letting others know, brothers, that you will participate, you will take this cup. Cup is a symbol, it's a sign that Jesus Christ died for us and shed his blood. And we have agreement so far to take a cup. And there were a lot of grapes, but they were smashed and became liquid wine. And as much as we are, we are so different, so many of us, but God brought us together, and He broke us so that we could cling to each other, and we will become one body. It's a Jesus Christ body, church. Please take this cup in the remembrance of Jesus Christ dying for you and for me.
I hope everybody who wanted was able to participate. Dear brothers and sisters, I congratulate you in um, being able to participate and share this Lord's Supper with you. May God bless you and strengthen you for the new month and for whole months. I, I know that so many people will go to mission trips, they will go to the different places. May God will keep you safe, protected, and God's blessing be with you. Вадим, спасибо тебе за слово. Вадим, thank for you. Мы с ним с одного города, братья и сестры. For your uh, word. Только он на 30 лет позже родился. We from the same city, uh, but he was born like a 30 years after me. Мы помолимся Господу, брат Петр совершит молитву. We will pray, brother Peter will say prayer. Stand before the Lord. <coughs> Father, we thank you more than anything knowing that you, as an almighty, omnipotent, omniscient being, um, without time, without beginning or end, um, would interact, with, would engage with this carbon-based life form, humanity, and, and not just interact, but love us, give us life, to even become like us, to save us from our sins, from the rebellious hearts that we live with. Father, we thank you. We bow down before you, recognizing this important universal truth, recognizing who you are, just to bow before you and say, Father, we love you too. We recognize the sacrifice that was paid for us. We remember it again, and we again recognize our sinfulness, and again recognizing that we need you daily. We need that cleansing blood to be washed, to be victorious, to stand with you as we press forward in this battle in, in life, knowing that soon we will see you face to face, knowing that this is so temporary, knowing that shortly we will be on the other side of that a door that leads to eternity and, and, and will be with you forever. But now, in the meanwhile, we can only rejoice in the victory that you've given us and worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll continue to stand and we've got, we're going to still worship. Our band is here. you with John 8 34 through 36 Jesus answered them truly truly I say to you everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin the slave does not remain in the house forever the son remains forever so if the son sets you free you'll be free indeed this verse is my favorite uh, one of my favorite verses and it. it's a line from man of sorrows and just keep that in mind as we're singing uh, this next song sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed. The sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as He
here, feel free to let the bucket pass you by.
part of this worship and remind thank you for reminding us about who we are in Jesus Christ we are victorious yeah I will read the last little passage everything what Satan can do he can make us die and that's what his payment for sin is he keeps us in capture in fear of death but Jesus died on our behalf and even though we will have to go through the valley of shadow of death we fear no evil we fear no death because death is entrance into a better place that prepared for those who trust Jesus and I will read 1 Corinthians 15 O death where is your strings O Hades where is your victory the strength of death is sin and the strength of sin is law but thanks be to God who gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ therefore my beloved brethren be steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that your labor is not in way in the Lord Heavenly Father thank you for your victory thank you for giving us opportunity to celebrate Lord's Supper and your victory in our life thank you for freedom us you give us freedom from sin from death and you put us in a very special place in Jesus Christ to be your daughters and your sons to act as you will act now may the Lord grace of the Lord of our uh, Jesus Christ son and the father's love and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us amen see you next time Sunday